I would like to give a very long introduction, but I can do somehow a small introduction. First of all, this is the very first difficult double of this semester, which is extremely late. As you all know, um, we had some trouble with our own organization, I have to confess. So, um, well, as a result, um, Eli is the first one to, to start the third, and I mean, towards to what we know, the final series of, of the difficult double. Um, so we're very happy that he really wanted to come for this very final set. Now, to talk uh, very shortly about Eli. First of all, I, I did not meet her that long ago. I met her in a very interesting conversation about the competition uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, or the status of the competition in Switzerland, where also Francois Charbonnet was there uh, on the same table. Uh, and I learned that perhaps they are the office with the highest ratio of won competitions. I was pretty shocked. I think they won more or less every seven out of ten competitions they do or something. It's quite amazing. Um, perhaps we find out also today implicitly, and I hope only implicitly, why it is. Um, that might not be necessarily the reason why we asked her to come. Uh, the main reason why we asked her to come is that um, she's been very interested for many years in Caccia Dominioni, an architect we find extremely interesting ourselves, very particular architect eh, from the Milanese scene, uh, and I'm going to explain who and what he is, because I'm sure that Edi will do that. Um, and even though it had been a topic for her uh, PhD, uh, you could argue that's just two, two worlds, uh, one in separation to the other. But at the same time, the office EMI or Amy, uh, she does of course also with Christian, who I thought was here, but then I saw him running out just a minute ago, so maybe he returns. Uh, he's working, of course. Somebody has to run the office. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, I would say closer scrutiny of that office production, at least to us, um, give some strange parallels. Now, conscious or not, um, we be curious to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here and inviting me. I am... Um, very happy to present today my work on Caccia Dominioni and um, maybe it, it really has been kind of a long work and it started with an interest for his architecture as a student and then I um, started my PhD on him and then it became more and more scientific um, during the process of writing a PhD. And I um, today will almost only speak about Caccia Dominioni and his work and of course because it's this set in the difficult double I will in the end come to one project of ours. Oh, the microphone I need to turn it on underneath here. So I have kind of two tools here which <laughs> I have my papers also so it's a little bit difficult. So okay. Now do you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh, it's much better. Okay I see. So um Okay, um, yes, I'm very happy to be here. I, and the dissertation on Gacha, of course, is very important for the whole office, but then when it became also a kind of a PhD project, it became kind of a scientific project, and of course, I also tried to bring that back to the office, but to a certain degree, it also remained something for its own, on its own. But I think it's it's um, the reason why I made this PhD or did this um, research is because I think it's very important when architects do research not, and not leave this field only to art historians. That's something that I already found out during my studies when I read texts written by art historians and I, mentioned, I, I noticed that they were not really um, written for architects, but more for art historians <coughs> and photographers and so on. So the knowledge they produced was not really kind of interesting for me as an, kind of an architecture student or later on as an architect. So I think it's very important that architects also do research and do that with a different kind of setting and approach. Okay, so let me start with my paper here. Good. So I prepared two parts. I will primarily and mostly talk today about Luigi Caccia Dominioni. And then I prepared a second part where I shortly will talk about one project of our office, um, the Stein Wies project in Portugal, which is also on the uh, poster you published. Okay. So Luigi, maybe, maybe it's too late. Yeah, maybe yeah, you'll make it 
It works really easy. Yeah. Yeah. If you have failed the uh, infrastructure, it's not easy. What do you think? Oh, it works. Just put it down. Very slow. <laughs> when, when I started this PhD dissertation, I found out that I that you find quite little on written on culture dominion. This was an extremely important premise for this um, dissertation. So. Um, Luigi Cacciadominioni is an architect from Milan who has never been in the front ranks of architectural debates during his lifetime, searching in publications and archives for statements by the architect one finds very little. He has always preferred to let others speak or write in debates and there are many reasons for this great restraint. One is surely that he distrusts theories and academies. And the architect's family background is presumably important as well. Gaccia was born in the palazzo on the Piazza San Ambrogio. You see actually this palazzo here. It's the one behind, the brown one, with the lighter basement. And he was born in this palazzo and he's a, a boy of an arist aristocratic and quite very, quite uh, wealthy Lombardian family. This is very important to understand his work. And this socially and also financially privileged starting point helped him to obtain kind of an artistic freedom in his career. Because he was not primarily concerned about earning money and his personal context assured him architectural commissions. So that was also very important. And his career coincided with a lively period of Italian history. Gaccia belongs to the generation that went to school under, under fascism established families during the Second World War, and experienced in the post-war period the flourishing of the new consum consumer society. And then experienced firsthand the attacks of the Red Brigades, the so-called Brigata Rosse, during the infamous Anni di, Piom Anni di Piombo years of lead in the 1970s. These very complex and far-reaching changes within a very, very short period of time constitute the material that crucially shaped his artistic praxis. This is a picture just taken quite recently, two years ago. Um, his most productive creative period was in between 1945 and 1970 and coincides with an exi exciting phase in the architectural history of Milan. Residential buildings, conversions, and interior designs make up the major part of his work. His clientele was largely from the middle and upper, upper class of Milan, a group whose self-image was changing as a result of the democratization and modernization processes of the immediate post-war period and the economic <coughs> boom years between 1958 and 63. So these clients, that's the thesis, um, or the hypothesis, they sought to update the architectural expression of their homes. I'm showing you also this picture because, of course, of the clothes of the architect. That uh, was not so surprising for me when, he, when I saw that he was wearing all red, because when I met him the first time, he actually was wearing all green. And I met him in his uh, uh, family mansion in Cenerina, which is actually the place where he spends the summer holidays always, like two or three months he goes there, and he was wearing there all green because it, sig it signifies hunt and leisure time and so on. And of course, um, this was 2013 when he celebrated his 100th anniversary, and he was wearing all red in order to, you know, to express um, urban, the urban setting and also kind of his class. And uh, what is important to understand, Gacha, is that self-presentation plays a big role and also um, the question of effects and meaning are um, extremely important. So everything, every detail has something to do with chosen and it's a particular. So, um, Luigi Cacciadominio's buildings and projects during this period, um, in the 60s and 50s, are characterized by different, at times even divergent thematic areas. The great spectrum of his creative activities as architecture and furniture designer is defined by a lack of any consistent and recognizable style. Numerous authors have pointed out to this unusual quality of his oeuvre, his reception in Italy 
in the 50s and 60s um, is <coughs> emphasized uh, by the eagerness to experiment and by his eclecticism. So, for example, Ernesto Nathan, Nathan Rogers described Gacha's attitude as a kind of a vivace experimentalismo, a kind of a spirited uh, experimentalism. For the art historian uh, Carlo Santini, Gacha's stylistic orientation corresponded to a brilliant, fluid and uninhibited eclecticism. And Giacomo Polino wrote in the 80s about his buildings as an ecle eclecticismo come or a kind of ecclesiasm as a response to problems raised by diverse teams. In one of um, the, the very rare um, interviews, Gacha um, remarked himself on his own work that, quote, it may be that I will be considered a romantic architect for my proposals, but perhaps that simply means I have freed myself from certain fetters of rationalism. I consider myself more of an experimenter, which is why I constantly run the risk of making considerable mistakes, which I admit openly. Nevertheless, for, my, for me, design is always a pleasure, and I would, ra I would rather risk managing a mistake than confirm to conventional expression. Well, this is very interesting, and I just want to point out the project I've been showing to you, which somehow stands for this eclecticism, it's a project uh, Gotcha has built uh, for Leopoldo Pirelli, and I'm sure you all know Pirelli. Pirelli is the guy who built, just maybe two years earlier, started to build uh, Pirellone with um, Joe Ponti. And then it's very telling that um, for uh, this office building, he chooses Joe Ponti as an architect, but for his own private <coughs> mansion in Porto Milan, he chooses then Gotcha Dominioni for this building. And, and actually the two upper parts of the apartment were reserved for, for the family of the Pirelli and then underneath the other employees could live. So when you, when you look at this architecture, you, I mean, you don't see necessarily the richness behind it. You mention, I mean, you see a little bit kind of these different influences. Uh, you, for example, see these particular window shapes that come probably from the Engadin, kind of this, this angulated um, um, sides of the window, and then when you enter, you find out that there is this huge baroque staircase, which is extremely particular for the 60s. You would never tell that it's a project from the 60s when you see that. And then entering again, and this is not his apartment. It's this is an apartment of one of his um, partners in the in the ground floor. You see this enormous richness and also this particular interest in space. And this is uh, another image um, from the apartment from Pirelli. And what you also see is kind of the, the connection to the church just across the street. So it's this kind of visual um, um, perspective that has been staged in the interior is also very important. So the architecture Gacha developed exploded the rationalist understanding that dominated at the time and led to a language that was, in the context of Italian post-war architecture, positioned as a di fuori, uh, beyond all conventions of modernity. That is quite important, and you can also see that here in the next project I'm going to show you, the project uh, In Corso Italia 2026. You maybe know the, uh, the project by Luigi Moretti in the same street, just 50 meters ahead this project was built probably a uh, little bit later. Well, the distinctive quality of Gotcha's architecture can be demonstrated using the example of this uh, multi-story residential and commercial building at Corso Italia. Gotcha produced this building from 1956 to 61, commissioned by and in collaboration with the engineer and developer Camillo Bianchi, and this is a name which is quite important, Camillo Bianchi, because he has almost built north of Milan after the Second World War. The large building complex has two arms that connect it to the existing street facade on the Corso Italia. The two six-story wing looks like residential towers, a low three-story volume stretches between them. The horizontality of this flat volume is emphasized by a continuous two-story window facade of steel 
which projects out slightly from the line of the facade. The building is faced with small, dark, red ceramic tiles. The side towers resemble the corner towers of a medieval castle. The construction of the horizontal window facade recalls probably a display window of a commercial floor of a 19th century Parisian department store. Um, so this project uh, also kind of shows this kind of eclectic attitude and I just want to point out that this project was highly criticized by people like uh, Aldo Rossi, for example, thought it's impossible to build something like that in the center of Milan. It reminded him uh, much more at, uh, on, of kind of situations in Portofino as he wrote, which is a kind of a small holiday village in Italy. So um, it was highly criticized and not really understood. And I'm mentioning that because starting off the PhD or the dissertation or kind of this research on gotcha, I had to find out how to approach these projects. Because if you look at uh, the critiques or the reviews, or if you look at what the debate was telling, you don't find actually so many um, hints to, to, to contextualize his work. So then um, it really forced me to, to look very precisely at the plans, at the architecture, as, as almost as an art piece. That was kind of a helpful methodology to, to find out how could I explain now um, the particular qualities um, of this architecture. So then when I am going now closer into this building, you see there is, a, there is an entrance here. <coughs> and it's kind of a passage that leads you towards the entrance of the building. And when you look a little bit um, closely, you can't <coughs> see it really now. But what was quite interesting was the floor. There were kind of mosaic tiles on the floor. Maybe you see it here, yeah, you see it much better. On the floor, and it's, the research started off a little bit with this observation. So, on the floor in the entrance to the courtyard, um, white wavy lines mesh irregularly, overlapping with bands of color, forming whirls and getting lost. This chaotic model of circling paths recalls the crest of waves and has almost the effect of a vortex. The drawing of the floor flows into every niche, pulls out again, flows in a new direction and surges into the passage. The floor somehow becomes a metaphor for the past, a story about what has been and can be experienced. So, paths and movements are a central aspect of Luigi Cacciadomiglioni's designs. That is evident from his sketches on which he outlines the possible paths of future residents with many exploratory strokes. Quote, with the floor plan, I really get going and cut loose. I am a slalom speaker, <coughs> like Tony and Stenmark, says Katja, expressing his passion for working on floor plans. In his architecture, the interior takes priority and he calls himself a piantista, somebody who loves to work on the plan. And uh, of course, his buildings are more or less designed from inside out. So, the occasion and inspiration for his designs are first and foremost human activity and motor function. According to Katja, people tend to seek an, seek an uninterrupted flow, as you can see it beautifully in this plan, when walking and rounding off abrupt changes in direction into gentle curves. He says himself, Quote, it is important to understand that human beings do not move in straight lines, like animals and cars, like water and streets. They instead follow continuous paths describing curved, line, curved lines. Translating movement into architecture leads to spatial figures that imitate this flow spatially and sculpturally. He speaks, Kaccio speaks of the so-called forma scivolante, kind of a sliding form, which is intended to offer the residents a kind of a frictionless life, daily life. These spaces evoke associations with enchanted paths, labyrinths, or caves. 
Accordingly, his floor plans are not the result of a placing of elements that partition space in order to separate a specific number of functions from one another. Gatcha's way of designing is more like the activity of a digger or a carver um, who carries out the mass from inside in order to create space. His paths are channels, quote, around, around which the support material accumulates. Odd locking incrustations, and you see that here, these incrustations or thickening of walls um, are kind of the, the rest of a um, uh, digging process. And it's very interesting in this context to mention that Boromini, for example, described designing also as cavare, kind of, you know, digging out from a mass. So on this particular floor plan, um, if you look at the staircase, you see the staircase is formed into two places. One one is here, and then there's a second space here in front of the entrances of uh, the apartment. And the floor plan looks like it has been hollowed out and polished by being walked in repeatedly, and the corner of the room of here are angulated and tie off the stairwell from the entrances. Two areas result from different movements. The stairwell as the backbone of the residence stands for rapid upward and downward movement, while the entrance embodies relaxed and slowed entry. The cramped space created by the narrow half landings and the darkness accelerates the climbing of the stairs kind of this, this moment. And what is also very nice is the, the expression of the handrail, because it also um, contributes to the dramatization of space, because in, as Katja explained to me once, his idea is that the person descending uh, the stairs is meant to grab this um, sphere in order to swing from one turning motion, uh, to swing from one uh, stair of, uh, flight of stairs to the, ne to the next. So kind of this, even kind of um, things of the movement from, from one, um, um, from, uh, store of, stare of the other. So, so the, the question was now, um, after having seen or observed all, all these different aspects, um, how can these very specific ideas be explained? As kind of a researcher or a, kind of an architect who wants to know why, or why do we, or do, does he um, uh, come to this idea? And what is now very interesting is that after 1955, there was an essential change in his residential floor plans. Um, the older floor plans, like the one, I'm, I don't show you that, but the older, the first ones, right after the Second World War, are quite rectangular. Um, but then, in, after 1955, he bega bega begins to modulate his interiors more sculpturally, rounding them off, bending and folding them. Increasingly, <coughs> one can say that Gacha sets his floor plans in motion. It may be coincidence that this development occurred at the same time he began collaborating with the artist Francesco Somaini. Somaini um, uh, did this kind of very, very explosive paintings and also dynamic sculptures, which evoke associations to movements and they must have influenced Gacha's sense of space and creation of sp space. I brought you here a film still, yes, where you see Somaini working as a sculpture. Um, that's, that's air coming out, and this is a kind of a sculpture he's producing with this um, air blast. So this collaboration um, started off in the early 50s, and stopped in the 60s and within this collaboration they produced kind of artisan artistic work. So for example Francesco Somini was, was um, um, responsible for the floors, for handrails. Yes, it's very nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> now he disappears in form. And this is, for example, one of the uh, things they collaborated together. This is a balustrade. It's also a huge wing, kind of a, almost like a baroque 
fallen wing on these stairs that, of course, has a double role. On one side, it's, it's a piece of art, and on the other side, it's also a balustrade. So this kind of collaboration they were extremely interested in, and it's also interesting to know that, that they were not the only one. Um, there were many architects and artists in this period collaborating together in order to um, um, revive, actually, from a new, this old idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, or of the total work of art. And uh, it's very interesting that Somaini um, was part of the MAC, the Movimento Arte Concreto. He was actually in a leading position. It was very important. And their idea was actually just to, to um, or they called actually for a new Sintesi delle Arti, or a Unita delle Arti, or a Arte Totale, how they, that's how they um, named it. And in this Movimento Arte Concreto, there was also another guy named Lucio Fontana, who you know for sure. And um, Lucio Fontana is a little bit older than Simonini, and he already started in around 48, and even earlier, with his work on the so-called Ambiente Spaziale, which actually goes, um, has the idea already for, for inventions in space. We can become more precise. Um, maybe the way um, Fontana realized his Ambiente Spaziale artist, artistically can best be understood using the example of this installation. Um, in 1949, the artist installed Ambiente Spaziale a Luce Nera in the Galleria del Naviglio. He applied a figurative papier mache sculpture based on organic forms to the ceiling and painted it in various fluorescent light. So that the figures seemed to glow in bright colors. Critics of the time reported that the visitor Visitors were not just observing a work of art being presented to them, but were rather involved in an art spectacle, because their bodies and clothing also reflected the light. In this installation, Fontana combined for the first time architecture, painting, sculpture, and the viewer into an ambiente spaziale, a Gesamtkunstwerk, and uh, he says in a quote, uh, color, sound, movement, time and space, are combined and create synesthetic experiences. This installation expressed the idea of a new spatial art that produced visual, haptic and auditory connections between people and the space around them and involved them in complex processes of perception. Space was not finite, but lim not limited, but rather dynamic in motion and striving towards infinity. As Gaccia and Somaini would later, in the early 1950s, Fontana already collaborated with different uh, architects to, to create this kind of uh, total work of arts. He called these um, interventions interventi spaziali to create integral elements of living spaces. So he covered walls, ceilings, and floor coverings with artful ornaments pierced them with small holes and even cut them out, as you probably know um, the work from Fontana. This is very interesting um, uh, that they really experimented a lot, and of course it also remained a little bit limited in its way. Then this is uh, an intervention Kaccia and Somaini did together, actually in the same building I've been doing in the beginning in Corso Italia. And here, of course, it's all about this intervention and collaboration between architect and um, artists. So what you can see that um, here initially, or later on also, but here maybe the basic architectural elements were reshaped artistically. Um, and the idea here was, of course, to give, to give the everyday kind of the aura of a special, perhaps even festive activity. Um, and this unique example you can see here is actually done for uh, Somaini's aunt. If I'm not, yes, it's Somaini's aunt. So, and in the background you see also beautifully uh, Somaini's painting. And Um, this enormous fireplace stands in the middle of the room and centers this polygonal space. The shaft, a massive looking pillar, loomed upward like a tree, 
as if they're growing from the floor up to the ceiling. The ceiling was deeply recessed around the pillar, reinforcing the impression of an organic unity between the fireplace and the ceiling. Delicate white lines climb up the pillar, winding several times, reaching out the, to the vault and running across the ceiling. On the edges of the room, they become even more delicate and ultimately taper out. These winding forms recall the plant shoots, branches of flowers, but also flickering flames and flashing arcs of light of, light of a fire. The lines were carved from the light gray plaster of the ceiling and pillar using the sgraffito technique. Um, the most impressive evidence of the collaboration between Gacha and Somanini is provided by the more than 40 mosaic floor uh, they've done together and I've showed you one in the beginning and that's actually the, the sketch um, Somanini has done to prepare the floor in the Corso Italia. And here you already see the dynamic lines and explosive figures formed uh, by a small piece of marble. And, and the, the idea was um, that kind of this floor reinforced and this, uh, the, the space culture created. So you see here how he worked. So culture would give him the floor plan and then he would start drawing the the, kind of the movimenti, the movements, uh, could be interesting, and then they discussed it together, and then, of course, after 65, it became even more ornamental, and it's not so much about movement anymore, but more about um, decoration of space, also. Okay. And what I like very much about this image, which is actually from a private family album from the Mondelli, and I'm going to talk about them afterwards, and they, they have this floor by, created by um, uh, Somaini, and I like very much that they actually move on this kind of moving decoration. Mm. Kacha's art of space evolved out of this collaboration and influenced the form of his floor plans. So Maini's designs for floors underscore this view. The residence is, is conceived as a kind of a horizontal spatial sculpture in which more meaning is attributed to the planes of movement proper than to the areas of retreat. Um, with the aid of the medium of searching lines, he imagines himself in the place of the future residents in order to anticipate their figures of movement. Gacha presumes that people and space will interact, space is set in motion, and this moving space in turn sets people in motion. Gacha's idea of a synthesis of the art includes the user of the space as the one who both cause and perceive the movements. So, um, maybe I will be now a little bit, kind of show you how that works in a, in a, in a more detailed way. Um, I'm going back to the residence in Via Vigoni where you can see how these kind of um, movements um, do not only lead in, in physical movement, but also lead to a kind of an emotional movement of the, of the dweller. So this is the uh, apartment in Via Vigoni I showed already before, and I showed you before this staircase with the entrance hall. And then you can see here you have a lenticular atrium, and you enter here the main space, and here this is kind of an extra space which can be used as a bedroom or a, um, a dining room. So when you enter here, it's very nice. This is the lenticular space you enter here. And you have here a particular glass window, which you can see here. And when you enter the glass window, people are actually exposed here in a kind of a window frame situation. And here you see the chimney, which is slightly folded into the space. And above the chimney, you have a mirror. So when you enter, actually, it's very nice that the, through this lenticular space and the window here, people are mirrored also here, so you can actually have an overview of what is happening here. And, and um, if you go deeper, you see that also here, this is the situation here, um, where you cannot really tell then when you are in our kind of 
um, involved in this uh, spatial experiment, who is actually watching whom and what is actually happening on this stage-like situation. And what is also interested, interesting in this sense that culture moves people in two senses is the quote um, he, has, he has given them many years ago in the 60s when he says, quote, it has always been important to me to make residences seem larger, for example, by extending paths, which is always opposed by a certain view that wants to shorten them. I don't like a direct path into the living room because it offers no surprises. Part of the architect's profession, I believe, is awakening a series of emotions. So, Gacha employs sequences of paths for dramaturgic effects for him. Designing means Vakundar and Astoria telling a story, and his interiors can be comfortable domestic relaxation, but also kind of festive um, occasion and entertainment. Technical finesses that increase comfort are incorporated along with tried and tested spatial layouts to conform a bourgeois way of life. So, um, as I said, the home was um, kind of seen as a, as a stage in many cases, and what is maybe also very important, I, I didn't talk about that, is uh, in the beginning I talked about the effect of this curved line, and um, the question now is what differs actually spatially the, the curved line from, from a kind of a linear line in the plan. And the curved line, as you see also here in this project, is very important. So here this is, this is also in Corso Italia, but it's a, it's a tower behind the building, and you enter it here from the elevator, and you have to do a spiral movement in order to get into the apartment. So the curved line is really important. And one of the questions was for me then, what, what is it different? And, one can say that um, if you have a kind of a straight path in front of you, the objects um, reveal it themselves from afar. You already see from afar what, what is to be expected. In a curved situation, you actually see, uh, you don't see what is happening. So the, the space is only re revealed like slowly and in forward movement and in sequences. And that is what is happening here. Um, in Gacha's cases very often. So the impression of space when walking a straight line is perspectival and uh, on a curved path one can describe it as, as scenographic. So the, the scenographic movement I, aspect I tried to show you that in this case and here of course you also have it that somehow you enter here and then kind of you know see here kind of a dark corridor, another curve and you're still in this corridor and then space somehow explodes in front of you in this in this uh, Y-shaped space. Um, so um, then another aspect of this idea of moving people in architecture is the attempt of culture to make actually the floor plan also in a certain way flexible. And this idea is attempted, for example, here by doors, and particularly by this door here that consists of three actually doors. And uh, if you look at the floor plan, you can read it then with this door in quite different ways. Um, in a very kind of conservative way, you could read like three sections. One, this one here is one section, and then here you have the private section here, where the family bed, I mean the master bedroom is, and then here you have the children. And this is kind of a um, connecting space, and here you have the place of the servants. And of course, this threefold door then um, uh, connects this main space with this um, space here which is actually the space of the children and that which was then um, during parties, as the players told me, was open in order to con connect these two parts with each other and have kind of a bigger living room. So then this kind of cut between the public and the private part was uh, not seen so rigid as it may seem at first hand. So this is the interior and by the way, this is the apartment that Gacha designed for Somaini. So you enter here, you see that? 
this is this is actually the the, the perspective back, and you see this mirror here, which is also important because it mirrors back the outside. And you have this spiral movement, and you enter here. And then, of course, the, the doors are set in a way to close this part also. This is this door here. And the doors are not necessarily regarded to be doors in a kind of a classical way, but more than kind of um, walls that can be moved. And here, of course, you see this three-folded door. You hardly see it because here it is actually here. Um, it's, it's glazed and it has a lot of reflection and therefore you um, hardly can conceive it, but maybe here it's better. You see, I mean, you can kind of really control and regulate kind of the space by this door. And here you see this construction with the pillar in the middle and then these three the doors are hung up. And I also like to emphasize that this kind of, this idea of a new flexibility in bourgeois homes was not at all new and was really thanks to this um, collaboration between architects and artists. And the example I bring is in a way even more radical. It's, it's uh, a collaboration, Angelo Mangiarotti, who you probably all know, did with the American artist William Klein, and it's actually a panel here, you can see that. And this panel is also, it's not necessarily a door, it's kind of panels or walls and you can um, turn in, in the way you want to. And in this uh, Domus article, there is actually also the formula, how many different um, positions you can choose, I think in total it's 140. So um, this, this kind of new flexibility into the home that not only kind of, um, you don't only move and perceive as a dweller, but you have the flexibility to change your own apartments according to your own needs um, was even discussed in a broader context. Okay, so now uh, after I've shown you some aspects of his work, I, I would like to continue with the presentation of one particular project that I think is very interesting and of course very well known. And I um, like this project a lot for different reasons. Um, but maybe in this project I can also uh, show you how important the client is in Kacha's case. They, without the client you never reach this kind of refinedness of the project. And in this case um, the client is a family called Mondelli and uh, the landlady is called Elena Mondelli and she's particularly important because she's an architect as well and she actually did this work in collaboration with culture. So she actually drew the plans, that's also important. Um, and uh, this fam the family background of this family is also important just to make you see who the clients are. So the Mondellis, they, they, she studied architecture and he studied also engineering and they, after, after the diploma degree, they, they went for a master's degree to Cornell University and so that shows you also the standing of the family. So they would not only, no, they are not, they are very Italian of course, but they are extremely mundane people. And, and the site was, is now of course in the center of Milan, but in the 60s or 50s, when the father of the Monelli bought the site, it was not at all in the center, it was considered to be in the outskirts of Milan, and Elena Monelli didn't like it at all. She hated it actually, because it was full of barracks, it was dirty and so on. So she didn't want to move there, that was also very important. Only when um, her husband had the idea to commission Gatcha, who by then was a kind of famous architect, they could imagine themselves living there. That was also important. And, and uh, this was actually the house before. It's a kind of small villa on the piazza side. And of course, she was a progressive woman and she could not imagine herself kind of cooking in the... Well, of course, they had servants, but still in these kind of villas, the kitchen is in the, is in the underneath, in the, in the, um, the cellar. And this kind of you know, um, um, limitations, as a modern woman, she could not uh, imagine that. So um, they decided to commission Gacha, and by, by after this decision, she was really happy about that, and um, because she knew Gacha's work very well from magazines like Domus and 
Casabella. So you can also say that in the 60s he already was kind of a famous architect for these clients. And uh, for them it was also important that uh, they only would move into this area if they would receive a kind of a cultivated architect. Sure, cultivated meaning that, um, of course, they are modern people, but kind of a too modernistic expression as maybe people like Terani had done before, which is based on rationalization or industrialization or prefabrication. For them, that was too, uh, how can I tell that, um, too reductive and, and a kind of a reduction to the necessary and to the minimal and was therefore for them an expression of a lack of culture and education. So for them, it was really important to still kind of represent culture. So this is uh, the building photographed by Giorgio Casali and, and I'm going to talk a bit about this um, expression. In structural terms, the building, like nearly all Gacha's new buildings, uh, it is a skeleton uh, construction. So that means that the load-bearing structure and the enclosure of space are separated. <laughs> and they also represented, to a certain degree, the prerequisite for dressing architecture, architecture without, with various architectural motives. So it, kind of, it was really a dressing, and you will see that also after, afterwards in the, in the individual floor plans. So the, the skeleton sculpture, uh, scru structure made it also possible that each floor plan has its own uh, plan. And the skeleton frame had made it also possible uh, to realize visual transparency by the means of large windows. But a um, glazed clinker, which is glassy and reflective, but opaque, has properties of glass without revealing the inside to the outside. The facade becomes a protective shell for valuable inner life and encrypts the interior to the exterior. Instead, the facade is declared to be a canvas for composition in the manner of art. And you see that maybe more precisely here in the plans from March 61. It's almost a pictorial composition consisting of horizontal stripes with black and white fields against a dark background. And this con composition extremely reminds of paintings of the proponents of the Movimento Arte Concreto once again, especially, for example, the abstract paintings of Mandio Ro. So in the case uh, of the residential building of the Piazza Carbonari, the wall and the opening, the traditional field and empty planes are made materially similar and together they form a shimmering skin of reflective glass, silvery aluminium and glazed clinker. Elena Mondelli, the client, found the clinker facades persuasive because they cleaned themselves in the rain and hence did not form a patina. So the great uh, durab durability of the materials selected makes the house seem always new and ageless, and she liked it very much. And what is also very interesting is this comparison. So the, um, the building, so you see that also here for, in this image, um, the building by the reflections and the kind of this, this light on, on the ceramic, the building is somehow um, connected with the, with the context in a quite particular way. And this also brings us back to a um, to an intervention by Lucio Fontana, because he also investigated or researched this relationship between an um, object, um, here in this case uh, uh, a massive, heavy, dark ceramic sculpture which is covered with a thick layer of glaze, and in a certain way, of course, uh, this, this reflection um, makes that the object is charged somehow with the surrounding. So that is uh, interesting that even the ceramic, the ceramic tile were conceived in or discussed in the in the art scene. And then, of course, uh, the outside is worth mentioning. You see, this is quite particular. That's the other side. Um, what you don't see actually is here. Um,
here there is there is a kind of a cut in the building where you would see the elevator moving onwards and downwards. And here this is a bay window for the upper floors. And actually the Mondellis, they own this one. And this one was reserved for um, the sister of the Mondellis. Um, and then afterwards they, they sold, uh, during the building process, they sold uh, all the apartments to friends and and yes, kind of famous people, and they developed then with Katja the floor plan. So again, you see this elevator, which is also quite particular in the case because it's moving on the facade once again. Um, the outdoor elevator and the aluminium bay window are worth mentioning, as I did. They look like futuristic elements. The visible elevator rises up four stories like a space capsule in a science fiction film and then disappears in a volumetric projection. The energy charged cap of the elevator becomes a metaphor for the dynamic and economically rising Milan of the 60s. So as I said before, the skeleton structure made it possible to adapt the individual departments in a multi-family building to the individual needs of its residents. So, Rationalization, standardization, and serialism became the prerequisites for culture to produce their opposite, namely unique units. Each apartment in the residential building on the Piazza Carbonari has its own specific floor plan, and culture developed this kind of prototype, this building as a skeleton structure and individual floor plans several times. Um, you probably know this building in, in Via Ippolito Nievo 28. Okay. First time tried that out. So you have also this kind of, you know, this facade, which is quite similar to the facade we had. And it's, it's separated from the interior. And in the interior, you have different um, plans. And he built that also another time in the same street, a uh, little bit later in, the, in 66. So then we come to the Mondelli apartment, and, uh, which actually Elena Mondelli then also draw. So you can see that there is this rectangular shape. And this uh, rectangular shape is almost under pressure, and within this you have this kind of almost organic forms or um, polygonal forms kind of carving out space uh, out of this limited space. Um, this kind of fluidity of the interior, interior, you can see it on, uh, very well here in this corner. And this is actually the corner for the children. And uh, the reason why it's so narrow and, uh, and so, kind of so small, I mean, these, these rooms are almost nine or ten, not more than nine or ten square meters, which is very small for this kind of apartment. Uh, the reason for this is that Elena Mondelli got pregnant with a third child during the building process and they had to kind of dig out another space out of this mass. So this, um, and if you look at this, uh, you can also see that so you enter the apartment here directly from the elevator and then you come to the entrance hall and then you have here um, the, the representative spaces like here the I've got living rooms and here this is the dining. This is the bay window that connects um, here this space with the kitchen. And this is the elevator we have seen, it's out from outside, kind of these moving elements. Of course, it's not the, the main elevator, it's only the elevator for the servants. And then you go backwards here, here this is the children's space, and this is for the servants, here. So when uh, they finished it in 1963, you can see here that um, originally the walls were covered with a kind of a reddish um, um, tapete. So um, the uh, Gacha called, calls this color tobacco, and with this color, of course, he wanted to emphasize the interiority of the space. And now these are some newer pictures. It's um, now it's, um, it's a little bit yes, it's all white now. And this is actually the situation where you come out of the elevator and you see the situation. And then here, this is the elevator opening itself, of course. You see the floor tiles by, by Francesco Somaini. 
and this is now in this main space um, in the middle. This is the view towards the dining and the kitchen, as I said before. And here you have two areas in front that are separated by this very, very thin wall. And of course, this wall has also a very, very thin door, so you can also change um, the, the interior. I mean, this kind of flexible wall has also been uh, realized here. And this is the perspective from, from the dining back. And you can see, actually, these are the doors. This is the door. And it even has paintings on it. So. So, um, of course, I am going now to have a break and talk about a project of our own. Of course, um, it's the setting of the studio, the typical double, and, and um, yes, let me just start. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk now about a project we just recently, um, no, now, now it's a year ago, finished it a year ago, and of course it has some affinities with the work of Katja, but not so much in the de uh, during the development, but more the, uh, when it came to the execution, then it became important. And of course it has also ceramic tiles, but we can also discuss then kind of the, the meaning of the ceramic tiles in this project. I think it's different in comparison to the project I showed you before, in comparison. So this is a project, um, a multi-floor housing project in this center of Zurich, quite close to the art museum. And it's, um, it's actually situated here. And when we first, I mean, it's, it's <coughs> the character of the neighborhood is kind of a villa, former villa-like situation. So now you have many different structures, a school, for example, or here, the school by Neuenschwander, or the, uh, the children's hospital. But um, when you enter this neighborhood, what is really interesting is that um, there are many, many different typologies to be seen, as I said, with the, with the villa, but also the hospital, the school. But this um, neighborhood extremely feels homogeneous when you enter it. So it's, the question was for us, why is that so? And we found out that actually the trees that are, many of them are protected, form like somehow they're kind of a kit in between these different pieces of architecture. So when we started the project, it was clear for us so you can see that also, the site is here. Um, and you see also here that we have some trees here, and these trees um, are protected. So the competition brief said uh, to us that you would um, design a building behind protected trees, which are beautiful and which are extremely massive and high. So um, when we started with the design process, we found out that, of course, there are many, many different um, typologies to be seen on this site. And since the trees function as a kind of a kit in between these different typologies, we don't have to kind of, you know, contextualize or kind of, you know, start kind of a dialogue between the existing typologies, but we can free ourselves a little bit because the trees in front of the house will um, 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 emphasize the connectivity. So what, what we then did, this is the, how we found the site when we first visited. This was an old old villa, which we then tore down. Um, but the question was then how to find a kind of a other kind of language or form in order to fit this size. And we became very, very interested in aspects of nature and of the picturesque. And uh, we started kind of investigating different um, realms and one uh, aspect which interested us most was um, the kind of ruins in architecture that somehow are the architectural form that are closest to nature. So uh, by looking at ruins and also then natural forms as kind of these forms or basalt formations, we somehow developed a form on one hand around these existing trees, which is very important to kind of have interesting spatial, um, yes, spatial forms. 
But then also the question was how would the floor, floor, floor plan then um, um, respond to this um, nature analogy we've been looking for. So um, what we thought is interesting if you look at these stones is this kind of extruded moments, uh, these basalt formations and these polygonal forms that extrude and uh, who have a kind of a strong verticality in them and, and we try to um, um, uh, sort of translate this moment into architecture so you have also kind of these these pillars going from from the ground floor up to the up to the um, sky. And what we also did is that that the floors they, they don't go through, but they are cut because they follow also the topography. And this of course emphasizes the verticality of the, um, of, the of the project. What was also important for us is kind of how the building ends. So kind of you know, we. There is, of course, an attic rule to be followed here, but we try to plan that as much off as possible, so it would look a little bit like broken on, on, the, on the end. So um, this was also in this investigation we did on the ruins that are coming out of these buildings, they don't really end. So um, here you can see then what uh, how it looks and when it was finished. So we decided here for to go then to, to clad the building with this green ceramic tiles in this case, because we were quite fascinated by the material because of two reasons. One reason was that, um, of course, we like very much the, the, this this kind of um, reflection on it. So it, the shadow and the, of the trees and so on, they would somehow reflect, be reflected very beautifully and it's kind of this interference between nature and, and architecture can be kind of seen very quickly. Yes, and then I go to the interior and then of course the research was how would you find a kind of a coherent answer to this extremely organic form from the outside also to the inside and it started off with sketches, I'm going to quickly show you them. Um, and slowly, um, during the competition process, we found out that these basalt formations, they should really form also the, the spaces from inside. And, and it uh, was very hard then to find, if you're totally free, you know, it was very hard to find a kind of an answer by um, how to develop the space from inside, and how, how, to, how to find the right degrees and the right angles in order to create a good space. So it's, this is also, it showed you kind of the mess we had during the competition. <laughs> Until we then found something which seemed to be interesting. You see that here, so um, it, has, it has two staircases and it has one elevator each and the elevator goes directly into the entrance hall which is uh, goes back maybe also to this bourgeois idea that uh, you would not have kind of share the staircase but you would um, go directly into your own apartment and the only place where you actually meet your neighbors is in the ground floor and what you also can see here in this um, plan is that how difficult it was to kind of find the right angle, as I said before, so it was kind of a process between printing out the, uh, the, the ground floor and then sketching over it and then scanning it again until one had the idea that it would be okay. So, so this is how it was built then. <laughs> of course it wasn't that quick, but uh, it wasn't. So then of, you see this, this is the floor plan and you see it consists of four fingers with, which has something to do with the trees outside and on the side. And then we also like very much the idea that in each corner you have an apartment and uh, the, this figure then somehow um, uh, kind of makes it possible that you feel somehow in your own, um, in your apartment, in your own uh, Thing, yes, or, and what is what is also nice is, or what what we also liked very much is kind of then 
um, to kind of combine this idea with the sense with a kind of a past topic. So even though the ground floors are quite different, there is always the same grammar of the past repeating. So you always enter in an entrance hall and then you have always space opening up in different directions and having different views towards the nature outside. So you enter, for example, here, and then you have here an opening, which is for the dining, and then you have here another opening for the kitchen, and it, uh, the space closes again, and then in the end it opens always in, in, the, in the living room, which is marked by a fireplace. <coughs> and this, this uh, composition of space with the loggia and the kitchen, it always repeats itself, which is also important for us. So the figure we developed, we called it then chamber and pass. You can also see it here, um, where you have you know, these openings and these possible passes you can choose in the floor plan. Here are some pictures, as I said, this is on the left side, this is the image on the poster and this is the entrance hall and on the right side this is the elevator and as, as I said, because we wanted that the elevator leads directly to the, into your own apartment, we thought that the elevator is actually part of your private sphere and not so much of the public sphere and for that reason it started <coughs> out with nut wood and has a mirror and you can even hang up your jacket if you want. <laughs> And then you enter, and in material it's quite reduced. So you have a kind of a Eula calc on the floor. The walls are slightly painted in a grey, also to emphasize the interiority of the space. Also because the grey reflects very beautiful the light coming from outside. It's very nice how it changes during the day, so in the morning sometimes it's even colorful. And then the the doors or all the wooden elements are out of nut wood because, of course, this has a lot to do with the bourgeois background. This is the kitchen. And here you can see this, this interiority of these passes we've been interested in. Yes. And this is from one of the apartments above, where you actually are really in a kind of a tree house looking um, towards the center of Zurich. Yes, and this may be the final image where you see how kind of art, architecture and nature are overlapping. Thank you. Um, you, you, you mentioned with Caccio de very much this relationship with the artist, mm -hmm. in a way, also the reference, but also the intense relationship. Mm. Um, when one sees a plan like you present with your building here, mm. one would guess you would work with an artist too, <laughs> uh, or, or not. I mean, in other words, I mean, is it, has times changed, you think? I mean, is there a kind of pseudo pragmatism in a plan like that, or is there also a kind of exchange maybe you did not review with people outside architecture when you work on the plan like that? No, I think Gacha in his time was extremely progressive to try out this, this, this. Um, I think Gacha was extremely um, progressive trying out this particular space. And, I mean, in our case, uh, we had the experience that it could work, you know? I mean, the, we had seen examples before, not only in Kacha's case, but also Gaudi, for example, had tried out these kind of particular spaces. And uh, for that reason, no, I mean, um, it's, of course, more risky to try that out, and you never know, I mean, you don't have as much experience for this kind of space as for like, normal rectangular spaces. And nevertheless, you, you kind of knew that it could be very interesting, and. And, and of course, this kind of structural parallel between nature and, and, and architecture seems to be very interesting because in the end, I mean, it's, uh, it's also very interesting if you find a kind of a coherent na narrative from the inside, from the outside to the inside and, and vice versa. So, 
No, I mean, of, of course, we did not work <laughs> with, with an artist, but um, at least you knew uh, uh, that you, you are not the first one trying out such a thing. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of, um, of course, with Petra de Mignoni, you were very much emphasizing that yourself. There's a discourse about the bourgeois architect in Milan, mm. uh, often working very closely together with his clients, as you suggested. Mm. Um, which, of course, at first glance, looks very different from here because it's a competition. You said you mm. win. Uh, it's uh, at the same time one starts to realize the the Dominioni houses, as the one you specifically explained, is also one which is not just one family, but a lot of them are rented or mm -hmm. sold, uh, sold to, to, to friends. Mm -hmm. um, so you start to compare also the amount of flats with the amount of tax you show here. So it becomes again closer. At the same time, what seems to stick or what seems to still be around is this question about bourgeois and the question about saying, how would I call it, um, a kind of debate or negotiation with the modern. Uh, you mentioned before the, the, the clients of uh, Kacha not wanting kind of <coughs> pure modernism because mm. it was considered too poor. Mm. So I, I think this debate about what is a poor apartment, what's a poor house, uh, what is the richness of architecture, um, our own, I would say, contemporary, perhaps in Zurich more than in any other place in the world, but discussion about what is bourgeois and whatnot. To what extent do you feel this is part of your, your work? Mm. I mean, um, in kind of this high individuality in culture's work, depending on, on the client, is really, is really particular, I would say. And in our times, it's completely different because I mean, we don't know the clients of the developers. We don't know them. I mean, we cannot foretell who is going to live there in future. But that is also freeing to a certain degree because if you don't know, and what, what you know but is, the, is that, that I mean, there are extremely different lifestyles at the moment, kind of societies atomized, kind of hundreds of different lifestyles. So you are not going to kind of, uh, it's not, um, expected from you to you know, in, in kind of design a particular answer to a particular lifestyle, as a bourgeois lifestyle is, mm -hmm. but you are asked, to, uh, you are actually freed from that. This is this is maybe very very different from the situation in Milan, where you you really knew the client and you collaborated with it. And and therefore, I mean, these kind of formal experiments we did in this project mm -hmm. here. Um, can have affinities with, with uh, projects by Gotcha, but I mean they are kind of you know, projections, projections uh, out of our own experience, and not so much answers to to needs of individuals. So, so I would say it's inter it's very interesting that maybe the result mm -hmm. there is there are some affinities, but they come from very very different sides. Huh? Mm -hmm. No, I understand that, but at the same time, I was I, I was fascinated. Of course, I talk a little bit as, as a Belgian here, so I apologize. But, um, I, I would guess that the fact, as I understood well, that you could develop an apartment even to sell or to rent, like this complex that you do, mm -hmm. uh, and you can pitch up to a level of uh, detailing and finishing. Um, I think this has a lot to do with the context of Zurich at the moment, yes. where you can sell apartments on a high price, I suspect, right? Uh, I mean, if in Belgium we would do an apartment building, we, we would not finish it. So as a result, many of the discourses, I mean, the floor, uh, the corners, the, the grey paint, uh, the wooden doors, as you all mentioned, they would not be part of the package. No, but, but this is maybe something you don't know, because in Zurich, uh, even for cooperative housing, mm -hmm. you do everything, also no. including the tradition okay. and everything. Okay. And not only in Zurich, it's in a whole switch. It really depends on the contract you have with, mm -hmm. with the client. Yeah. But it's... Uh, it's, mo it's most likely the case that the, the architect is responsible for everything okay. that can be. So, so it's, not, it's not particular that we design the kitchen. Yeah. And actually, I mean, if it looks maybe very um, prestigious and, and, and expensive to you, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, it was not. So it, it might be reduced really the, kind of the materials yeah. to a minimum in order to keep, I mean, of course, it's, it's not. Yeah. It's but maybe, as you say, the mm -hmm. fact that you have typically the task to design it until the end, whether it's expensive or cheap, yeah. that's a very interesting. Uh, for me, I must say, it reveals something I never understood. I thought, why are all these Swiss architects so fascinated by Milanese architecture from the 60s and 70s? But now I understand, because that's really a parallel. Mm. I mean, say, many other places <laughs> in Europe, <laughs> do not design, say, France or Belgium or even 
Holland, you do not design... For Italy. For oh, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, wow. you do not design the, the, the interior of the apartment. I know, and, and this is really a kind of a bad development because architecture then is Absolutely. kind of separated into an interior world mm -hmm. and an exterior mm -hmm. world, and, and I mean, in the best of all cases, it comes together. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's very interesting, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit going on on these topics, eh? but uh, of course the kind of critic that uh, Aldo Rossi was, was um, <coughs> referring to, to, to Cacio Dominioni was about uh, disengagement. You know? I mean, uh, the, the real problem for, for Rossi, <coughs> despite, let's, let's say, the, the extreme elegance uh, and talent, of, of Kacha was that uh, Kacha was ultimately not caring about society, not caring about the city and so forth. No? So that's that's quite evident. So it was ideological mostly, no? Yes, it's very and interesting that you mention it because I mean you know, as long as Rogers and Giapunti were still active in Domus and Casabella, Baba and Rogers, Kacha was published very often. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Manfredo Tazzoli yeah, from the Radars. And of course, then, of course, he was considered to be the bourgeois ar architect and, and all these kind of left intellectuals. No, no, they, sure, they really sure, it was, <laughs> was totally cut <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out. But you know, it was... Um, yeah, was Rogers was a, at, at least... It's kind of, you know, stance. Yeah, yes. but Rossi himself somehow was ambiguous, no? Yeah, because then it's... Yes, he was very ambiguous yeah. about yeah. him. But of course, then Manfredo Tazzoli and all they, they really kind of... Yeah. You know, even in in the architectural history of Cesare de Seta, um, Kaccia is only kind of named as a as a designer, kind of a furniture no, designer. No, sure, sure. And um, but I mean, there was this kind of you know bias against against Kaccia, But if you if you go and do the research, you see that before '64, before actually Rogers disappears, Kaccia was very much part of the scene. He did all these triennial exhibitions. But he just never says anything. That's a problem. Yeah, yeah. He just does, doesn't want to, you know, talk on a kind of an intellectual or academic level about his work. And for that reason, it was very easy also to explain him. True. But if you if you look then and ta start talking to his clients, uh, you, you find out that he was not this shy guy, not at all. So th that's what you also learn when you look at his dresses and so. So he has kind of this particular. He became kind of. This kind of this sensitive human being, according to kind of a new um, way of living for this uh, for this upper Milanese class. Yes, so it was kind of. No, because you know, my, my question then would be, uh, right now, no, in, let's say in post-ideological times, mm. whatever that means. Right now in Switzerland as mm. well, as we pointed out, how do you see yourself? I mean, because. Again, uh, you do, I think, buildings of extreme elegance, you know, uh, which are answering uh, in a very, I would say, creative, but precise at the same time way to the answers the competitions in this case are, are offering to you. But how do you see yourself, your office, uh, with regards to the city, with regards to society, whatever that means, <laughs> because I know it's a tricky. If you implicitly want to ask if, you know, if we engage with the city, oh yes, we do. No, of course, I mean, of course it depends on the competition and on the scale you're working at, but... But I find, I find but, quite interesting. But um, we are, I mean, of course, it's, it's not like, of course, this kind of, you know, this 1950s and 60s, before 68, I mean, there was really the division of class, no? I mean, there was this mm -hmm. kind of upper class and this, this, the other class. And of course, this is not even the case anymore, no? I mean, you're architects. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, you're working within a society and of course you, you get, you do city planning as well as, as you do kind of plan a kitchen. And this is, I mean, this is the challenge, but also the, the beauty of it, no? Mm -hmm. No, but what I find very interesting is that you come with a form for your building which at first you say answers the same criticism or deals with the same criticism as Rossi's on the Caccia building in the Corso Italia. 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 At the same time, the way you explain it also, it's very carefully placed uh, in negotiation between the scale of these houses and the scale of the school and, and, and somehow it's both at the same time. So I think urbanistically it's a very interesting proposal also on that level. 
And then all of a sudden you see, and that's perhaps whether you call it post ideological times or the even covered field or whatever it is, and this very clear distinction between like there you build like this and there you build like that is gone. And I think it's very interesting in how you answer that. Yeah. But okay, that's, a, that's an aside. Maybe a last question from my side. When is the Kacha book uh, appearing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I hope it does. <laughs> That's a uh, nice <laughs> No, um, GTA publisher accepted it to publish it, which is very nice because you don't have to pay. Mm, great. And now the problem is my time. Yeah, but I'm going to do it this year. This year. <laughs> <laughs> this year is, is going to be the year because I think. I mean, it's incredible that there only has been one exhibition by mm. Fulvio Iracha in 2002 <coughs> on Kacha, and of course this, this is also not without reason that nobody really does it because the family is extremely complicated. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the family is somehow, um, they're extremely proud of this work and nevertheless they want to control you. So in my case it was also always a kind of a big advantage that was I was considered from them to be an outsider from Zuri coming and looking and they don't really understood what I've been doing but they 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 wanted to control me and at a certain point um, they realized they cannot and they just like the fact that somebody's coming and going but but uh, they uh, for some of the sisters I mean there are my three children they, they are jealous of me too so it was it was really kind of a very very hard collaboration, if you can call that, <laughs> at all. <laughs> because, of course, I mean, culture is now 100 and it's going to become, in this year, 103 years old, so he's, he's the dominant figure in the family. Everyone around him is kind of considered to be second. And they are, they're also kind of weak persons in comparison to culture, so it, it's, it's extremely hard to, to somehow deal with this family. I hope you manage. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> we should, if it's okay for you, we should, we should uh, close because we need to still eat something. Yeah. Uh, or is there a very urgent question? Please ask. Uh. No? Now you're really, they're really insulted. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Prokos, you always want to ask questions, but uh, I actually have one. But do you need it? I mean, yeah, it's not an urgent question. Go ahead. I mean, because you chose, I mean, having worked on the YouTube archive of these conferences, I mean, of these lectures, uh, this one was like maybe the purest kind of juxtaposition between the work of the kind of ancestor and, and your own, and you even chose to just focus on one project, which seems extremely compelling, I believe. But uh, I was wondering, is that simply due to the fact that you have like a very deep knowledge of Cacho Domino's work? Or is there any other reasons why you chose to do this kind of juxtaposition format instead of the sequence format? That uh, maybe it, the, I mean, the, when I said in the beginning that I did my dissertation on it, it, it really means that you have a kind of a different kind of knowledge on a different <coughs> work than if you are just kind of in love with a certain difference, no? And so it took me like many years <laughs> to study that, and, and for that reason I thought it would be interesting to show more about his work and you know I mean then of course I, I also know that when only this Stein Wies project can be compared all the others cannot even be compared in such a way yeah but, so, but, but I, by the way don't think so mm -hmm. huh? but that's maybe another conversation because of course you could say one project is comparable because it has I don't know the bricks and the kind of zigzag mm -hmm. but I, I don't think so I, I, I mean that's of course also implicitly what we try with the with, uh, with the difficult double. Mm. Uh, okay, you brought in Caccia Dominioni very simply because of studying him. Mm. Uh, but, but we have this kind of weird uh, psychotherapy logic in our head that uh, I, I think all your work, I'm sorry, Christian, but all your work is comparable with Caccia Dominioni. And that's also interesting. I mean, but of course, never 100% and yeah. whatever. No, what I think what they share a lot is kind of this interest into the floor plan. Oh, yeah, this is extremely mm. important, so that the plan as a... But for the example, of the plan as such, yeah. No? Yeah. But for example, this revelation about the floor plan, for me at least, I don't know about Andrea because he knows everything, but that was quite quite new. Because, you know, the problem, as you just said, there's very few publications on Caccia Domini, you find them here and there in, 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 uh, in books on Milanese architecture, right? Mm -hmm. 
So you do not so much look at the four planets, you see of course the 45 degree angles here and there, mm. uh, but the, since the facades are so particular, mm. you'd say, ah, it's a mm. facade, uh, or it's the materialization or whatever, mm. so you all of a sudden open the door and you say, no, 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 the guy, <coughs> he saw himself as a plan maker, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, I find it a total new insight, mm. so that book has to come very soon. <laughs> No, I, mean, I don't know, Andrea, how you see that. I mean, because you see him too quickly in this legacy, uh, you just mentioned himself, David P. R. and then Sir Rogers and so forth, and you see a certain shared aesthetic, huh? and that he perhaps goes a certain way, mm -hmm. specifically. But, but the plan only plays partly part of that kind of uh, prejudice. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Well, that's true, and if you compare his plans with plans from us now going to David P. R., less interesting, I would say. Mm. Mm -hmm. I would say Manjarotti is touching Manjarotti, him. Yes, uh, well, only with that one apartment building. Yeah, I mean, he didn't build that rigid. much. <laughs> Manjarotti is much more rigid. Yeah. is crazy. I mean, yeah, he okay, becomes but the interior building. designer of his own architecture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. With his skeleton. This Via Quadronno building, though, has similar topics, I think, in yes. development. Yes, but, but still, one still one it's one. more structural. Yeah, I built two, so. The other one is a weird circle of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.